Good morning. About time for us to begin this morning. We're going to start with number 53. Number 53, give me the Bible. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 before our scripture reading and prayer and then dismissal to classes. Give me the Bible, verses 1, 3, and 4. Let's sing out together. Give me the Bible, son of God, let's sing in the water of blood and death of souls. No soul can hide that radiance is so beaming. Send Jesus' name to sing and sing the laws. Give me the Bible, for the message shining. Thy love shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, so and love combining. Scripture this morning, taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Ephesians 6, reading from the Berkeley version. You children, be obedient to your parents as the Lord's representatives, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may enjoy great length of life on the earth. And you fathers, do not arouse your children's anger, but bring them up in the instruction and admonition of the Lord. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Dear God, we do thank you so much for allowing us to gather, read and study more of your scripture, more of your word. Help those teachers that are teaching, but be with us as we listen attentively and glean the meanings of what is taught us today. Be with our teachers, elders, and especially be with Chad as he brings us the lesson. But guide us always in your pathway, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again and welcome this morning to the Bremen Church of Christ. We have a good number assembled here for our Bible study period, and we're certainly thankful for that. 
beginning of our gospel meeting this morning, so in conjunction with that, we will dismiss the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes, as well as the middle school, high school, stay up here with all the adult classes. You're dismissed. Good to see everyone this morning, and great joy for me to be here. I've been praying a lot about the meeting. I know you have to. Uh, it's always a delight to be around new Christians I have not met and see some of the other older ones. I'm not too good with names or faces, <laughs> but it's good to be here, and I thank you so much for giving this invitation to be here and be a part of this. My wife uh, has a sister in Birmingham, and I dropped her off there. And uh, we'll go back on Thursday and pick her up. Now, you've got to understand there's a condition. You're not allowed to tell her anything I eat this week. That's it. I have got great accommodations at the motel, and thank you all for that. I was down this morning having a good hot breakfast, and uh, all these little girls were running around with these uniforms on. So I assume there's some kind of tournament in town. Later on, as I was getting off the elevator, I saw a woman push the cart and got that going, and I asked her, she said, yes, we're having a tournament, said, uh, softball tournament. And uh, when she did, then she said, uh, they had some more games today, and then they were going to go home this afternoon. As I was eating my breakfast then, I saw the television, and the Catholic Church was canonizing two different men. I thought about those two events, and it really brought to my mind the fact that the religious world and the world in general is woefully ignorant of what God says. Now, they use the word canonization this morning, but what it means is we declare these two men to be saints. As if to say, the Catholic Church can decide, okay, this man's a saint, and you can only be a saint after you die. The Bible talks about the fact that when people come to Jesus Christ, that their whole life has changed. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, talked about different sins that people were engaged in. And verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 6, And such were some of you, but you're not anymore. And the reason is you have been washed, justified, sanctified, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The word sanctified means you've been set apart to be a saint. No church can vote on that. So this morning, as I sat there, I saw all of this activity on the television screen. People coming up and bowing to this man and kissing his ring, doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, I wanted to cry. <laughs> I wanted to get up and kick over a table somewhere. <laughs> this is ridiculous. But it's not so ridiculous when you understand that the religious world as a whole does not teach nor understand the Scriptures. So this week we'll try to open up our Bibles and, and look at what the Bible has to say. Not enough to be offensive to anybody. But do our very best to say, okay, this is what God's Word says, and you and I can understand it. A lot of people have the idea today that you just can't understand the Bible. And so I often ask people, what do you do when you come to red light? Eh, I stop. Why? Well, it's the law. <laughs> but wait a minute. Can you understand that? I hope you understand that law just like I do. Because I don't want to come to the intersection if you don't understand that law. I I'm amazed that in all areas of human endeavor, people know about law. And they know exactly what the law says. I don't have to ask you to raise your hand, but what is April the 15th? <gasps> Tax day! How do you know that? Well, that's the law. But how do you understand that? Well, that's the law. 
Okay, what does your children normally eat when they sit down for supper, if they sit down for supper? Oh, we've got to eat vegetables. And I hope then that sometime during the course of the night you have them take a bath and get on clean clothes and go to bed. That's the law. But, but it's not written down anywhere. But they know it, don't they? So why is it that when we come to the most important thing of all life, that's our soul, that suddenly we take leave our senses? We can't know that. We can't understand that. Yes, you can. Because the Bible is a written document. And anything that is written down, you have got to make a decision. What is this saying? Now, if you tell me, oh, but y'all, I got this voice in my head. I'm sorry. You may have a voice in your head, but it's not God talking to you. So whatever that voice is in your head, I can't deal with that. For the simple reason, I don't know what the source of it is. I don't know what's going on. Maybe you had chili at 10 o'clock at night and went to bed with an upset stomach. I don't know. But this much I do know, if it's a written document, then we have to be able to understand what that document says. Now, if you don't, then we're in trouble. When the uh, Affordable Health Care came out, the Obamacare, I wrote to one of our senators in Indiana, and he was very kind to respond back and said, I'll be glad to send you a copy. Man, fantastic. I turned on my computer, that thing's 2,000 pages long. I didn't have the paper or the ink to get that out. And I said, you read this in a week's time and figured out what to vote for? Oh, no, we don't have to know what to vote for. We're going to in, put it into law, and then we'll figure out what it means. <laughs> Folks, you can't do that with the Bible. This 66 books, and it's such a great volume of books that it represents. It gives us the mind of Almighty God, and you've got to know what God wants you to do, how he wants you to think, act, and feel. Uh, we've lost that in our world. Uh, Teenagers will know this now. You, maybe you as parents don't know, but it's something like IDK and LOL. What's that mean? I don't know. And lots of love. They text each other all the time like that. And what it is, they, they take one letter and they put a word to it and they know exactly what it means. Well, that's great in texting. That's great to be able to, for teenagers to communicate with each other and understand everything that's going on fine and dandy. But the trouble is, that when we come to the Word of God, there is a, a lack of interest in digging things out. We want these short versions, little letters that say, Psh, okay, that gives me all I need to know. Folks, you're going to study the Bible all your life and you never will know everything's there. But you have to spend time in it. So turn your Bibles down, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's do some work there. Uh, as we turn there, get started and everything again, good to be with you. Chad, I've heard so many good things about you, man. I just... Know you're going to be doing good work here. Appreciate you and your good wife both. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. Paul is making a declaration about things that he wants the Corinthian brethren to know. Uh, and in this statement to them, he is referring to our role as Christian people and what goes on in our life. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. For we are laborers together with God. Uh, two words that often will come up as you go through the study of the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, is the word work and the word labor. The word work oftentimes refers to the job that you have, whereas the word labor refers to how you do that job. And most time when the word labor or laborers is used, it has reference to working by the sweat of one's brow. You put a lot of effort into it. How, many, how much effort does it take to hit three letters, LOL or IDK? That doesn't require much effort. You just type it in, and the person on the other end of that line knows what you're saying. But if it's God's Word, a written document that has got to be opened up, it takes a lot of effort. A young girl, 16 years old, goes to school, and the school was Columbine. Sixteen years old, and one of the schoolmates had a gun trained on her and said, do you believe in God? Yes. And he pulled the trigger and killed her dead. A man, I believe it was Oklahoma, out jogging one morning. <laughs> Three teenagers on a porch, bored, 
got in the car, followed him, shot him in the back, and killed him dead. Folks, we live in a world where there's not much effort put in to understanding life, nor how to live it, how to think about things. I grew up a teenager. I've had plenty of times when I was bored, but I never had an indication to go get a gun and kill somebody with it. We're living in a time when people don't want to think about responsibility. Just let me live my life the way I want to. Don't you tell me anything. Don't expect anything out of me. Let me do what I want to do. So when Paul says we are laborers, we are working at the process of being New Testament Christians. We want to live our lives in such a way that the whole world will know who we are and what we're about. Matthew 5, verse 13. Jesus says, Ye, that is the people who will follow him when the church is established, ye are the salt of the earth. Now we often say it, and rightly so, uh, that salt of the earth in that context means your influence. How people look at you and how they think about you. So you use the influence of your life to be the person that you ought to be. You come to verse 14 of that chapter. And we're talking about the fact that the church would be a city set on the hill. Why? That people would see it and know where it is, know the location of it, and thereby understand what's going on. Verse 16 of the chapter says that what we have to do is expend our life using energy, effort, to do our good works before being. Why? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That sums up our Christian life. Why do we live the way we do? We do it so that when people look at us and understand us, then they will be able to glorify God because they see the conduct of our lives. Now, brethren, bear with me. What I have reference to is not the conduct of your life by showing up at a building. Because you can sit in a building and go flat to sleep the whole time I'm talking. I have no clue if you're with me or not. I don't know that. What I have reference to is the conduct of my life is what do our neighbors see in our everyday life? What do people see that work around us? What do people see that we pass in the, in the marketplace every day? What, do they, what conclusions do they come to us about us as they look at our life and they view our life? What conclusions do they reach? Well, Matthew 5, 16 says they're supposed to see us and glorify God. So anything I do in my life that does not bring glory to God, there's a problem. I need to reevaluate what I'm doing with my life and try to put things in perspective so that people will understand that I am a Christian above all else. Uh, in so many respects, I would say in this country, okay, I'm an American, uh, I live in Indiana, I, I don't want to tell you what I am publicly, but anyway, uh, I vote publicly one way or another. You do too. But those things are peripheral issues. They're outside the issue what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when people look at us, do they know that we are Christians? Uh, the church sent Barnabas. When they heard that the Gentiles were receiving the truth, they sent Barnabas all the way, said you go as far as you can, try to go as far north as you can to Antioch. He did. He found out that the Gentiles were just readily accepting the word of God and, and when they did, then he made every effort he could to teach as many as he could and he finally found out he had more work to do than he possibly could do by himself. So he left there and he went to Tarsus and he found Saul. He brought Saul back with him. For a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, teaching people, telling them what God's word was about and what they need to do to be right with God, the whole thing. They did that for a whole year. Acts 11, 26 says that when they had assembled with themselves with the church in Antioch for a whole year and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now the real world around us, I'm saying in our country, has lost respect for what that name means. Now you and I shouldn't, but I'm saying the world out there, they, they, every time they hear the word Christian, they just go bananas, they go crazy. They feel that we are people filled with hate, we have no interest in other people. All we are is just a bunch of bigots or right-wing nuts or whatever else. But the world as a general rule, when they look around and they see the word Christian, they form some immediate conclusions. Now, if I say to you, uh, 
do you think racism is wrong? Oh, absolutely, Brother Blair. What is racism? It's the idea that you judge a whole group by what you see a few doing. What the world in our, let's just say in our nation, what happens is they may see some kooks out there, some nuts out there, and they judge the whole world, they judge everybody in Christianity the same way. This is what y'all are like. Well, as Christian people, you and I know we, we go to a different sound than that. Our life is different than that. We don't do that. So again, back to Matthew 5, 16, we show the world what we believe in, who we believe in, and how we live. So they ought to be able to tell by how we dress, by our language, by our conduct, nobody should have any doubt as to whom we belong to. Because the theme is that you and I belong to Jesus Christ. We don't belong to ourselves, our wives, our husbands, our children, our grandchildren. We belong to the Lord. Now, everything flows off of that. When you belong to Jesus Christ, it changes the way that you live your life. When I was growing up, we had, I guess they call them space heaters, right? And those things be set up against the wall, and you'd get back behind that thing, and you, oh, oh, it feels so good. Not about you, but I had some people in my family that would love to come by and crap the front of your pants and jerk it, and it would just sear you. When I'm growing up, and there is no central heating, right? So if you get cold, and you get really cold, you got to get rid of that space heater and turn around and say, oh, that feels so much better. The Bible says, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. So here's the message. The closer you get to God, the more loving you become. Now there's a heater, you come over here, you're away from that heater, and the farther you will get away from that heater, the colder it gets. Now here's Jesus. And, and, and the Jews are so proud of all these big buildings in Jerusalem. Oh, have you ever seen anything like this? So what Jesus does is, he says, I'm going to tell you some things. Some things are going to happen, and that when these things transpire, you're going to know that there will not be, Matthew 24, verse 2, one stone left upon another. This city will be destroyed. Now one of the signs that he gave was, Matthew 24, 12, that the love of many would wax cold. It did not refer to unbelieving Jews. It referred to people who were already in Christ. I mean, how can love wax cold unless you already got it hot? These are Christian people. And what Jesus was saying is, before Jerusalem falls in A.D. 70, the love of many of you Christian people is going to wax cold. Now, Jesus, what's the evidence of that? Because iniquity is going to be on their bound. When iniquity grows, love diminishes. When love goes up, iniquity diminishes. So, for that reason, the closer one gets to God, the more loving you become. The closer one gets to God, the less selfish you become. So, our whole life is built around God, not our wife, not our husband, not our children or our grandchildren, or our great-grandchildren. My life has got to be built around God, because that's the source. So the closer we get to God, the more loving, unselfish, kind, generous, everything happens because we are closer to God. Ephesians 4.32 is enjoined upon Christian people. Be ye kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You can't read that and say, okay, it's okay to be unkind. No, it's not. You can't read that and say it's okay to be hard-hearted. No, you can't. Because the idea is the closer you get to God, what takes place? Kindness. The closer you get to God, tender-hearted. The nature of God begins to be a part of what drives us and motivates us. So you and I are workers together with God. We're, we're breaking out in some spiritual sweat here because we want to be the people God would have us be. So then he, he well, let's go to the end of verse. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, he says, We are God's building. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6, Jesus says that he is a Christ, he is the Christ over his own house. 
Whose house are we if we hold fast that confidence from the end? So I will tell anybody who wants to know that the church is the house of God. 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, the church of the living God. So this is the house of God. Not brick and mortar or stone, but you and I. We are the house of God. That means then that every brick, every mortar, everything that makes us stick together is from God. So how do you and I live our lives? We come here on Sunday, we come on Sunday night, we come on Wednesday night, we dress, we, we act right, we want to be sweet, we want to be kind because everybody's looking at us. But folks, I'm telling you, it's what we're doing Monday through Saturday that tells the world what we are. Because you know, you drive down this street or any other street in any other town and you'll see cars all over the place where people are meeting together, come together to, quote, worship God. And I'm saying that when they see that, it's good that they see that, but that doesn't tell you what's going on in the hearts of men who walk through those doors and sit down. It doesn't tell us that. The only way they can really know that is when they observe on a day-by-day basis what you and I are doing with our lives. First Peter 3.15, again he uses that word sanctify. We're saints of God. You sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You be ready always to give answer to any man that asketh you, that is, anybody that continues to ask you about your faith, your hope in Christ Jesus. To sanctify in that context means that you enthrone, you enshrine, you lift up God as the center and the focus of your life. It is not about our wife, our husband, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And my determination, your determination, to live before him as the world would need to see him. Now, in the rest of 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, it says that you and I are God's husbandry. All right? It can mean either a farm or a garden. Genesis chapter 2 is a retelling, so to speak, of the events of Genesis chapter 1. So in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to be looking at Adam and Eve and and what they did is they were brought into existence by the power of Almighty God. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 that God planted a garden. Miraculously, God starts this garden. We call it the Garden of Eden. And when he does, that's where he takes the man and puts him in that garden. See, God's always been concerned about planting. So he says to Satan, Genesis 3, verse 15, after Adam and Eve had sinned, he says that the seed of woman is going to bruise your head. Now you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. Uh, And then that helps us to understand that when Jesus came, he was the seed, the seed of woman that came to be the Savior of the world, Matthew 1, 21. And by dying for all mankind, 1 John 2, 2. What he did was he made it possible for all men to be saved who choose to follow the Lord. That seed is always present in promise all the way to the time that Jesus comes. Galatians 4, verse 4. He came in the fullness of time, made of a woman, made under the law. So here's Jesus Christ on the earth as the Son of God, as the Son of Man. He's all God, he's all man. He lives, he dies, he's buried, he's raised the third day. He ascends back into heaven and sits down at the right hand of God. Now that's what you've got to believe. That's what I have to believe. Now if I don't, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. And, and again, you go back sometimes to, to the lives of children as those lives begin to unfold. And, and sometimes, well, let me, let, me, let me approach it two ways. I think sometimes parents beat themselves over the head needlessly because something goes wrong in that child's life and they want to say what did I do wrong what we could have done different what what things could we have have done to make things different so sometimes parents beat themselves over the head needlessly about things that transpired when those children growing up Uh, and and I'm, I'm not talking about the Bible now but there's no owner's manual with kids okay now the second thing is sometimes as parents we need to be beat over the head because we hadn't done a good job Now, by that, what I mean is sometimes we get the mistaken notion that getting them to a building somewhere, that's going to take care of my responsibility in, quote, raising children. And I've heard 
in conversation with parents who talk about the fact that this child has grown, they're married, they went in the military, something else, they got away from God. And, and, and sometimes those conversations, a parent will say something like this, well, I, I don't, we brought them up right. I take, we took them to church every time doors were open. And again, that's good. But here's our problem. If we get them, say, 40, 45 minutes on Sunday morning, a sermon, 30, 35 minutes, whatever, another sermon on Sunday night, maybe a Bible class on Wednesday night, that's not enough time for us to stifle the voice of the world. And we're foolish to believe it. I'm a firm believer in the assembly. I don't believe that any time those doors open, every Christian that makes up this congregation ought to be here. You need to be here. I, I, to me, that's what the Bible teaches. But I don't want to reach a thinking in my mind to think that all I've got to do is get these kids dressed for Sunday morning, get them, in, get them food or something, and get them in the car and rush to here and get here in time for, for services and then do the same thing on Sunday night, Wednesday night, and now... Whew, Boy, I tell you, I got everything done. That's not training a child. Because folks, I'm telling you something. They got devices in their hand that they will learn things you never knew about. They'll talk to people on those devices. You have no idea who they're talking to or what they're saying. The television. The television. Will give them knowledge you and I have never had at that age. Nor knowledge that we didn't need to have at that age. Shouldn't have had it. And my point is, kids today are so much smarter than we were at their age. Now y'all, if you're 12 and above, just close your ears. They're dumber than a box of rocks. Why? <laughs> they don't have the experience. They don't have the experience to understand where danger is, where this is going to lead me, or what's going to happen to my soul if I keep, keep doing this. Now, this way I illustrate it. It, 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 it. Please bear with me. When you leave Indianapolis, Indiana, a lot of times my, my wife's people, uh, down in Montgomery, Alabama, so we, we go that way. And, and, and I'm going to tell you this. Now, bar any kind of accident, any kind of mishap, flat tire, whatever it is, if you get on 65 South, leaving Indianapolis, Indiana, and you drive on Indi in, in, Interstate 65 South, going to or Montgomery, Alabama, you're going to come to Louisville, Kentucky. Brother, I don't want to go to Louisville, Kentucky. Then get off the road. You can't stay on Interstate 65 and not come to Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, it's 17 miles now. It's 8 miles now. It's 9 miles. <laughs> I, I don't want to go to Louisville, Kentucky. Then get off Interstate 65. As adults, we have the experience of knowing what life can do to you, for you, and with you. Teenagers don't have that. So somebody has got to step in when that voice of the world is screaming in their hearts and in their minds and telling them, oh, this is the thing to do. There has to be another voice that is raised that stifles the voice of the world. We can't do it in three services a week. We just, we can't accomplish that. Because they get voices eight hours a day from that other world. We get them maybe four hours maximum. So somebody has got to be mature enough to sit down and say to our children, you've got to study the Bible. That's a written document. That, that has the mind of God in it. You've got to know what this book says. And, and, and kids are so busy today because of the phones and, and because of all the things they want to do with their life. And, and life is going real great and real fast and so forth and so on. And sometimes... We have to be able to say to them, you've got to reserve time for God. This morning I thought, well, all those little children running around the motel. Going to play a softball game today. You know what just in my mind about to explode? <laughs> you have no time for God. You have no time for God. Now that mother that got off the elevator with me this morning, if you ask her, I'm a good mother. Because she traveled X number of miles, got the child to a ball game, got them checked in motel, they go to the ball game, they sit up there in bleachers and hot and sun and all that kind of stuff, and, and then they go pack up, leave the motel, drive back home, be wore out by the time to get back wherever it is they're going to. They have no time for God. 
That's our trouble. But here's, here's the thing that, that we have to kind of fill our minds up with as well. And that is, where do children learn how to have time for God? It's us. It's us. If our children never see us reading the Bible, if they never see us working by the sweat of our spiritual brow to put effort into knowing what God is telling me, then where would they pick up on that at? Where would they learn to do that? And, and, and lest anybody mistake what I'm telling you, I am not opposed to cell phones. I'm not opposed to the texting. I'm not opposed to any of that kind of thing. That's part of their world. I appreciate what they're able to do technology-wise, but my concern is that that cannot take preeminence over opening the Bible to find out what God's Word says. And you know what the advantage of a computer is? There are Bible programs now. You can open up a, 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 a Bible program, one kind or another. You can type in a word. It'll tell you everywhere in the Bible that word's used. You can type in something else. It'll tell you how many times that word is used. The end result of that is speed. But what those Bible programs cannot tell you is what is God telling you in those verses? The only way you're going to know that is if you open up the Bible and spend time digging into it, finding definitions, finding meanings, applying it to the time, applying what's going on, so that we will have a good understanding of what's taking place in our hearts, in our life. All right. God has always involved himself in planting. Turn your Bibles down to Galatians 5, please, just for a moment. Galatians chapter 5, we want to look at verse 22. Now again, I'm just trying to help us all see you're not sinning if you don't have it or whatever, but you need to spend time finding your Bibles and finding what, they're, what that Bible's saying, all right? I think it's great when congregations can afford these pew Bibles or whatever, so anybody that's visiting with us can open up, reach in the back of that pew and get one out. But you ought to have your own Bible. You ought to have your own Bible. When you come to worship, you ought to know, I'm coming to learn about God. Galatians 5.22 says, the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits, but fruit. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. Now what this tells me is, this is what the Spirit of God produces in the heart of somebody who chooses to follow Jesus the Christ. Love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There's no limit to how much a person can have in their life. God plants seed. Now how does he get that seed into your heart or my heart? When I opened up the Bible to Hebrews 8.10, it says God was going to make a new covenant, a new law, a new contract, with the house of Israel. And this is what it would be. God said, I'm going to write my law in their minds and in their heart. Now how does God do that? Is there some kind of miraculous movement of God? No. Is there some mysterious work of the Holy Spirit to get you to accept what the truth is saying? No. How do you do it? You do it because you study God's Word. That's how He plants the seed in our hearts. That planting of the seed in our hearts teaches us how to live, think, act, behave. And, and, and when we look at it in that context, Luke 8, verse 11, when Jesus explained the parable of the sower, He said, the seed, the seed is the Word of God. Now, as I understand Jesus teaching about it, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, go into the Mediterranean Ocean, and that, 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 that mountain would obey you. Was well, he talking about moving mountains like that? No, we're not talking about miraculous. What Jesus is teaching is, you have to have enough faith for that seed to grow. Plant it in the soil, it grows, it produces, and when it produces... It should produce those elements that when the world looks at us, why do you live that way? 
Why do you act that way? Why, why are you different than all these other people that, that I look around you? First Peter 4, verse 4, Peter says, Now they're going to think it's strange. What, Peter? <laughs> they're going to think it's strange that you do not run with them to the same excess of right. In other words, your former friends are going to look at your conduct and they say, well, come on, have a party with us. You always party with us. You, we, we always did these things. Not anymore. There's a different seed in my heart. That seed's got to germinate. It has to grow. And, and the Christian life then is a process of developing toward maturity. And, and I'll explain it as best I can from what the Scriptures teach us. And that is that as you mature in the Christian faith, and not when you first start out, all right? When you first start out, it's not an easy process. But the longer you stay in the Christian faith, this is the end result. This is the love of God. What? That we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. All right, got about three minutes. <laughs> Look very hurriedly. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. A two-year-old child can know enough that this displeases mom or dad and I'll get corrected if I keep doing it. <laughs> I used to say smoke the britches, but I found out that's incorrect. Now you can't say that. Now so I'm going to bust you. I found out they can't say that either. Uh, so I, I won't tell you I beat my children half dead, but I'll I just say we try to correct them, all right? Why does a child obey their parents? You obey your parents. You obey your parents in the Lord. You have a relationship with God. So you obey your parents because it is right to do so. Now, because of our world and the voices that are just vacillating all around us, the world will tell you that any time a person becomes a teenager they have, an, <laughs> they have a right beyond all measure to smart mouth mom and dad that's their right <laughs> no it's not I'm sorry again if we go and by the seeds that's been planted in our hearts we don't have the right to be smart mouth <laughs> and I guess I'm amazed that we can be smart mouth mom and dad and you go in a school room you're not supposed to do that teacher won't put up with it and if you get stopped by the law for speeding or whatever, try smart mouth on him and see what happens. As Christian people, we have to come to a conclusion, I want to live my life for the Lord. I want to do what is right. And if we live that way, then perhaps someone will look at us and say, why are you that way? Why do you act like you do? And we can answer, because I serve the Lord Christ. Thank all you, brethren.